start to have a conversation about portfolio approach to private market investing. And for this panel, I would like to invite on stage Samir Pitalwala, head of gaming, uh, APAC for Google Cloud, ex-business director, Epic Games. Uh, Rahul Singh, national head, private banking group, IDFC First Bank, with core expertise in SME and business banking. Bhavesh Su, general partner, Modular Capital. Govind Shorewala, founder and managing partner, Fair Angels VC. Nakul Saxena, uh, head of in investor relations and fund management at Let's Venture. And this panel is moderated by Shalini Prakash, investor at Purple Matters. Over to you guys, thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's lovely uh, to be here uh, talking about um, you know funding and portfolio construction and so on. Uh, to quickly introduce myself, my name is uh, Shalini Prakash. I am an investor, worked with several funds and accelerators in the past, and um, most recently an author as well. And I'll uh, let my panelists introduce uh, themselves really quickly. Yeah, hi, good afternoon. My name is Rahul. Uh, I am the national head for private banking for IDFC First Bank. Nice to be here. Thank you. Hi. I'm Bhavish. Uh, I'm a general partner at Modular Capital. We're a specialized B2B uh, software fund. Uh, thank you to Let's Venture for inviting me to be here today. Hi, uh, my name is Nakul. I head investor relations at Let's Venture and look forward to interacting with all of you as well. Hi, Hi this is Samir Bittalwala. I head games for Google Cloud for Asia Pacific and also Angel Invest and run a syndicate on Let's Venture. Hi, Govind Shorewala here. I've made about 40 investments in the last five years, specialize in first check investing, and happy to be here. Thanks, guys. So um, we have a good mix here, right? I mean, I see people in wealth management, to funds, to angel investors, uh, to running syndicates, and so on. We have a really good mix. So I just want to ask this question um, uh, right in. When you think about portfolio construction, for your LPs or for your clients, how does each one of you uh, look at constructing or designing for it? So we'll start with you. Thanks, uh, Shalini. So the way um, uh, we look at it is that, you know, as I think Anupam briefly touched upon, so when uh, a particular asset class like startup or private equity, you know, uh, in, in markets like US, it's already mainstream. In India, it is still considered alternate. So your portfolios, uh, uh, you know, your portfolios generally in India, uh, your public market portfolios are still giving you alpha, which means they are outperforming the broader markets. But in Western countries or developed markets, if you want to generate alpha, you have to come to a startup ecosystem or privately held companies. So because that's, the, that's where your alpha will come from because fund managers will find it very difficult to outperform broader markets, you know, going forward. Maybe in the next few years they will, but eventually they will not. So I think it is an important part of your overall portfolio. If you are a new investor, I would recommend that you start with maybe 5, 10, 20 percent of your portfolio. But if you are experienced, you can have a much higher allocation. Bhavish and Govind, this is for you, but more from the fund level, right? Uh, so when you look at uh, um, investment thesis or portfolio construction itself, what are, what are your approaches? We'll start with you, Bhavish. Yeah, so, you know, at a fund level, there are two things which you look at. One is, you know, the application of power law, which is nothing but, a, you know, a, a BC version of uh, Pareto analysis. So you have to have a minimum ownership because you don't know which company has the potential to return the fund. So typically, in a, a fund, you will have 10 companies. Two will give you uh, spectacular returns. Uh, five will give you average returns, and maybe two or three will shut down. So you have a very focused approach, which is yes. not free and free. So, I'm you know, gonna... Yeah, you know, we need to have a minimum uh, shareholding. Uh, that is one. And secondly, that, you know, you also need to protect dilution as subsequent rounds happen. Uh, so the, my favorite example is, you know, I give the example of uh, Sequoia. You know, they, on an average, across seven or eight rounds, they held about 24, 25 percent, which means they were always executing and making sure they didn't get diluted. That's how you make a return. So, uh, Govind, I'd like you to uh, address what's your uh, uh, portfolio construction like, and I also like your views on spray and pray as a model itself when you think about port uh, portfolio approach. So, my approach is largely defined by three things. I have personally seen value creation being the first investor. So, our approach is get in early, get in first. Second, like how Bhavish shared, and the question you asked, I don't look at pay and spray at all. 
since you're the first investor, we spent significant time with the founders, meet a lot of people with him, including experts, other investors and customers, and really take a focused approach. So it's first check, it's focused, and we look at three sectors at large, not one sector, because like how FinTech suddenly has many regulations coming in, right? So if the sector does phenomenally well, you have a great upside, but just to diversify risk, three sectors. So not pay and spray, founder focused, first check, concentrated, and three sectors is how I look at it. Nakul, what about you? When, from, when you talk about private equity, how do you look at portfolio approach? Sure, I think what we've tried to do at Let's Venture, and that's what we are doing over here, all the panelists over here who've got their syndicates, typically investors have been investing deal by deal, one, one particular startup at a time. And that's what we want to change in the country because private equity investments in the public side, they've been portfolio uh, investing. In, in private side, it's missing completely. And all the panelists over here are trying to do that, create their own syndicates and start investing up to 25 crores each into startups, come in early, so that for the investor, it acts as one layer of due diligence done by a Let's Venture. Second, the syndicate uh, ethos in gaming, in SaaS, and deep tech, all of that gets verified with the various fund managers as well. Okay, okay. And what about you, Samir? You're an angel investor, you were an entrepreneur, now on the other side of the table, and of course you've also been um, investing actively. So what, what's your uh, approach or thesis? So my thesis is essentially that we're seeing this happening as a secular trend over the last maybe three to five years that the internet is kind of matured in its current form factor. It's going to move from 2D to 3D. Applications are being built right now and businesses are being built to figure out what those tools would look like. And a lot of those tools have their roots in game technologies because game technologies are persistent, they're real time, they're able to kind of uh, allow you to build applications across a variety of sectors, whether it's automotive, architecture, to retail and finance. A lot of these folks are going to that space and the creators and the developers in this ecosystem are Gen Z because that's the generation I think millennials kind of grew up on the internet and for kind of one generation uh, not native necessarily to the mobile phones, yeah. but Gen Z has grown up within games. They haven't grown up within YouTube. Uh, they've grown up playing YouTube is, and video has been already a part of the fabric of how they've grown up. So you're seeing these kind of, you know, businesses being built in that space which uh, have a variety of applications and you're already seeing sort of while the whole metaverse hype cycle will continue for the next five years. But if you take away a lot of the press around that, there's some fundamental uh, shifts happening on the core infrastructure layer as the internet is going from 2D to 3D. Um, and that's, that's my bet and that's what I really understand. I think the last 10, 15 years and was really the, you know, data science as a branch of computer science was where all the activity was, which is why you saw a lot of companies which use AI and ML and, you know, AI and ML continues to surprise, but if you've just looked at what companies like Midjourney are doing and DALI do and the, I feel the next frontier of a branch of computer science which is going to become very valuable is computer graphics and that's the kind of branch which I'm looking at and looking at companies and businesses being built inside of that. It just so happens that the core part of the technology primitives being used are very popular in gaming. So I'm looking at those as consumer applications, but there are also a lot of enterprise applications. Thanks, thanks, Samir. So one of the things is, you know, I'm a private in investor myself, I angel invest and stuff. So one of the things that's um, very challenging in your early stage is, you know, you may think of your portfolio strategy or approach for, say, the next three months or four months, and then, you know, you'll, you'll be changing it much sooner than you actually imagine, right? I mean, that's the thing about pre-seed, because there are also these trends and new technologies and emerging technologies which come, and you're constantly changing and adapting to it. So, which actually brings me to the, my uh, next question. So, Bhavish, I'll start with you, right? So, you are a, um, a vertically focused fund, right? right? You do B2B SaaS and you just stick to that, right? As opposed to someone like me who looks at everything and trends and stuff. So I've always, um, you know, struggled on which is better. Is there one better over the other? Or, and, and so I just want to hear your views on why you chose a vertically focused um, approach. Yeah, so Charlie, you, you know my journey, you know, in my first fund, you and I interacted at that time. And I'll be very candid. Um, I lost a lot of my LP money and my personal wealth in my fund one. Precisely because I was, you know, doing concentrated deals. 
I was not aware of power law being applied. And I think the second issue was uh, uh, I had no sense of valuations. So this is really coming to my circle of competence. You know, I've always been a B2B SaaS guy or software guy. So I said, in my fund too, let me not make the mistake of trying to understand domains I don't specialize or I don't have an operating background in. So that's one. So mine was a more personal reason. Uh, but also, it, the size of the fund decides the concentration. So typically, anything above a 50 million fund has to be diversified. Because concentration um, of one sector uh, can also be detrimental to the returns. Because you, know, you just have too much concentration. Let's say you had a hospitality-focused fund, and COVID hit you. What do you think is going to be the returns? You know, you'll just get wiped out. And now, even in the macro, uh, you look at from a macroeconomics perspective with the Fed rates rising, uh, the impact on the Refinitiv index on the venture capital side is uh, tremendous. Even on 75 basis points, the Refinitiv venture capital index fell down 52%. So it's very sensitive to that. So you need to have diversified bets purely um, you know, as a hedge also. Sure, sure. Govind, uh, what, what are your thoughts? So my thoughts are, it's a matter of expertise, right? So today, if you build phenomenal expertise in one thing, you can do it well. But the risks are there, as Bhavish said, whether it's the fintech regulations, whether it's, COVID, uh, whether it's COVID hitting a hospitality business. So I think for the longer term and to not get outlier returns on the upside or the downside, some diversification is needed. And Hence, you can pick two or three sectors where either you have in-house expertise or advisor-based expertise over picking one sector. You may get an outlier upside, but then you're risking the outlier downside as well. So, um, speaking about uh, di diversification and so on, so how do you guys uh, look at this, uh, Rahul, when you, when you advise your clients? Yeah, so we look at, uh, so even in public markets, so you need to, you choose a fund or combination of funds which are investing in different ideas, different sectors, because as Govind mentioned, Bhavesh mentioned that, you know, a particular sector can be hit by many things and you want to be protected. So the theory of diversification shows that after about 12 stocks or 15 stocks, beyond that, the risk is, uh, you know, with each additional stock between 1 to 15, your risk keeps on reducing and after that it kind of, the incremental marginal utility is very low after that. So that is how we look at it. You look at funds which are of different styles, different uh, uh, sectors, different ideas, and eventually you build something which has low correlation to each other. So you have five or six ideas in a portfolio which, are, uh, which have low correlation to each other, so they don't move together. So that's our, our way of building a, a good portfolio. Got it. So um, one of the things that, um, you know, we, we, which we lightly touched upon is one of course uh, diversification as well as how we can have a uh, focused portfolio construct, right? Um, but when you have newer technologies, how do you really um, adapt to it? And Samir, I want to ask you this question, you know, with say Web3 and so on, right? When you're working in large organizations, um, say at Google or even when you were at Epic and so on, right? It's very difficult to be as agile as a startup where you can, you know, move uh, quickly and adapt to the newer uh, newer uh, technologies and so on. So how do you, what's your approach to the new technologies and how does one look at investing and adjusting to them? I think having been a founder, you know that you need a discipline in not being distracted by the next shiny object. Just because there is, ob you know, the new shiny object comes with a nice press release and can get you attention by investors that can lead you down a really bad path if, because if you don't want to be running your company and your whole business chasing what's new as opposed to chasing what's going to not change. Um, I think the same thing within the case of technologies like Web3, especially with gaming, you need some time for the dust to settle. And most importantly, it's really about backing founders who are not trying to, who are trying to build sustainable businesses and uh, looking at, I think, you know, good, great founders are actually quite patient in trying to figure out how they want to use something as opposed to, you know, preaching to the, uh, preaching and being all like zealots uh, talking about how this new technology will change everything as opposed to saying here's the use case and here's how it can be built. So I think the simple answer to your question is uh, back the right founders uh, and see which, how they'll be able to use if they have got their feet on the ground and they've been there, done that, gone through the cycles, most likely they'll end up trying to find how this can be used as opposed to, you know, have a solution looking for a problem. 
I know, I, I remember when, you know, last year there were a whole bunch of uh, Web3 startups cropping up. I think investors and a lot of VCs were in a frenzy because they didn't know how to evaluate them. So, <laughs> so I, I totally concur with that. So, Nakul, what are your thoughts on our Web3 investment thesis? So, what is happening currently, that's exactly what is happening in the last one year, as you said. A lot of FOMO coming in, investors investing. I think uh, it's a question of play of both going sectoral and combining the various sectors together to create a portfolio. I mean, we've heard this in the private equity space that if you have 40 startups you've invested into, probability of loss is zero, right? And in fact, we have dip done a dipstick on the LV portfolio for the last nine years, where typically if you had invested in the worst year, 2015, every company, uh, 32 odd companies, your return is still about 7-8%. Right, keeping in mind portfolio allocation across 30, 32 odd companies. So I think what comes in over here is if you're able to uh, diversify, uh, go deep in some sectors, and you can choose some of the sectors here, add them part of the larger portfolio, non-correlated on the private equity side, I think that's where you can reduce risk. And that is what we're going to come out uh, uh, to our investors, suggest that because it's not being done in the private equity space at all. The other part I think which plays a very, very important role is are the syndicate leads spending time with the startups they're working with, right? Uh, and I think people on this panel and many others as well are spending that time, taking the time, helping them go not from the early stage alone, but to the next level, one to, uh, one to 10, 10 to 100 as well. And that becomes a differentiator. And we are going to double down with uh, all the syndicates over here uh, who are doing that, because that I think becomes the key differentiator and therefore reduce risk. Thanks, thanks, Nakul. I think one of the things that's also challenging is it's very different for um, an angel investor when they're looking at Web3 investments versus a fund, right? I mean, because there's so many, especially if you're talking about blockchain or crypto uh, platforms, there's so many regulatory aspects that need to be taken care of, so which, which makes a certain um, investing in certain types of startups very questionable uh, and funds become more answerable. So Bhavish and uh, Govinda have this question for you where um, I want to understand when you're doing a fund, right? Uh, how much of these gray areas do you really uh, sort of need to look into deeper before you make uh, these investments? Because for an angel, it is still okay, but as yeah. a fund, uh, you have more responsibility towards your LPs and so on. Yeah, I think at my stage, uh, the founder is everything. I think 50% of the criteria is on the founder because business models change dramatically at the seed stage. But what if there are some gray areas in which they're operating? Is that, is that a risk that a fund is willing to take? Yeah, most likely no. No? See, well, you, even if you look at, uh, let's say some, you, did, you contracted out financial and legal due diligence and some things came out, you would ignore if they were badly run. But if you see uh, areas of uh, financial impropriety, then you know, obviously you'll red flag it. And we've seen those kind of deals also. You know, where we're very excited, we've almost, uh, done a capital call to our LPs, and then you know something has come out in the financial due diligence. So these Someone's things. saying, are hey, why are you missing on the Web3, uh, uh, you know, wave, and we are missing on. Yeah, I, and I think uh, the infrastructure has to be built out by companies who are um, by funds who have large amount of uh, capital. It has to be done by. It's not designed for a small micro fund like me. I cannot take a Web3 bet because you know the commercialization opportunities may be three or four years down the line. Got it. Got it. What, what about you, Govind? I think it's easier for me to build an anti-thesis than build a thesis. So when investing in a fund, today I don't understand the Web3 or crypto space. It's very simple for me to not invest in it. And there's also an evergreen thinking, would this be there 10 years later? So the influencer space became very hot, creator economy. I said, there's no way I'm taking a play in the influencer space because I myself don't get influenced by them or believe in them. So for me, when you're running a fund, it has to be responsible toward what you can see as a 10-year business, 5-year business, and you can easily remove the fads if you just talk within, to talk to 10 people and you get the same consensus. So for me, building an antithesis is very, a very easy way to remove the fads from what's evergreen and what will build for 5-10 years. Thanks. So, um, you know, speaking about regulatory aspects and the challenges around it, uh, Rahul, I have a question for you is, you know, as an angel myself, right, uh, of course, I have a little bit more freedom. I can invest wherever I want. Even, uh, but if you see, like, a lot of these companies are not even registered in India anymore, right? So every time now, um, it's become, like, my first top five questions to ask, where are you incorporated now, right? Um, so it's become really, really vital. So uh, how do you, how do you uh, look at that? Does that impact, um, you know, when you're advising your in, um, 
uh, what clients uh, from public markets as well as startups if they want to do? How, how do you guys look at that? Yes, yeah, so uh, the industry evolves, right? So the first set of uh, venture capital regulations in India came in 1996. So it is relatively new. Then, you know, it was very narrow kind of regulations. Then in 2012, they started, uh, a SEBI had a regulation on alternate investment funds. After that, the market matures. But you look at this, look, look at it this way. I mean, in mid 20th century uh, in US, this industry was very small, but today it is $7 trillion worldwide. So it's become a mainstream industry. So as the markets evolve, the industry changes, investors get more confident, regulators change, the taxation will improve. Uh, you'll get better talent. So all, uh, I mean, just as an example, I think I was discussing with Nakul the other day, 20 years back, if you asked your friend, where do you invest? So they will typically say a fixed deposit or a land or apartment. But today, you know, most of them will say mutual funds, PMS, stocks. And I'm very confident that by the kind of stuff Let's Venture is doing, the kind of uh, regulations will change. In the next five, 10 years, you will see majority of the people will say the same about uh, the startups. So. That's my. So um, uh, I have a question for you, Sami. So you know, with um, you know um, NFTs and all these uh, emerging technologies, right? You said you know a lot of Indian founders are moving outside and you know building their own uh, uh, startups from outside of India and so on, right? So how important is um, a community that actually comes together important for these companies to thrive? And sometimes I don't know if there's a brain drain, you know, like everyone's just moving out and. Uh, I don't know if you're losing out on talent for this, but how important are communities for this? Because I know Google is very high on you know, communities and how they engage with entrepreneurs. I know you're more on the gaming side of things, but I just want to uh, get your view on um, you know, NFTs and all these new um, platforms which are emerging, which is a big part of gaming as well. Yeah, I, like you rightly pointed out, they overlap a lot because you know, I look at this as two sort of building blocks. There's the form and there's the function. The form is really 3D tools which are being used to build these immersive worlds and the function is essentially blockchain because that allows you to design these economies as a way either to retain users or to acquire users and you know in that case NFTs essentially unlock the ability for you to own a lot of these assets because you're spending so, many, so much time in building these worlds out. Um, I think you know like with crypto it's uh, obviously the community has grown dramatically but a large part of the talent just like because it's almost like this whole industry has come of age during the pandemic in many ways and talent is truly global um, i've seen a lot of these crypto startups also being especially ones which are trying to build you know these uh, either they're trying to build SaaS tools for DAOs or they're building DAOs themselves uh, a lot of folks are really just aggregating top quality talent either when it comes to developers or advisors globally and you know pretty much discord is if hey, everybody hangs out so it does seem that over the next couple of years, as more of these enterprise platforms, whether it's the AWSs and clouds, begin to offer these as tools and infrastructure, it'll become a lot more mainstream, but it's still a bunch of, I think, a little more crypto bros sort of set up right now, and that's uh, typical for any new technology where it's got a bunch of believers who all come together first, and then as the technology gets proven, it ends up being dispersed, and they end up being uh, a larger community which comes in. Yeah, I think I was just reading this tweet from Heyman, you know, Lightspeed this morning, where he was actually talking about how um, almost every other Indian founder, especially SaaS and Web3, are actually building for the world, you know, like a global product from day one. No one's thinking, oh, I'm going to build this for India and so on, right? Yeah. So they have this big vision, So it, which also probably becomes vital that they sort of are in this place, uh, which may not necessarily be in India, but somewhere else where they're catering to uh, the entire world. But it was... Um, it's, it's, it's interesting how uh, we, our mindsets have also changed, right? Like, as, and I remember when seven years ago, uh, we would question, hey, can Indians actually build products out of India? You know, that was, that was very questionable. And now we're a day and age where, you know, it's like a given that we can and so on. So I think it's, uh, it's, um, it's an interesting change. So, um, Govind, um, you know, with your existing uh, portfolio right now, is there one missing piece that you're saying, hey, I want to do this, but I haven't done this? Is there a missing piece in your portfolio right now? So I've invested in different stages. So I've invested as the first check, I've invested in mid-stage, and I've invested at late stage. So the missing piece is there are many founders who don't have 
the credentials. So there's a pedigree behind each founder, right? Either a degree or work ex. The missing pieces, there are founders with pure passion who may not come with the same background, but they need significant amount of time. But when you're running a fund, you can't do that, right? Where you, can, you may get in a cheap valuation, but you'll have to spend time. So I think funds where, in some sense, a shark tank, but where there's enough time to give to the founder to be operationally involved and take a significant stake at the early stage. I wouldn't do that, but I see that as a natural evolution coming in where non-pedigree or very different founders get backed in some sense. Okay, what, what about you, Bhavish? Do you have uh, any yeah, missing piece in your career? Thematically, there always will be areas. Um, so I can think of synthetic media as one. Uh, I can look at DevOps as a second area. You know, the problem is not the themes. The problem is um, in the Indian product ecosystem, you know, there's still a, not a lot of money available in the B2B companies. I'll give you a statistic. So if you look at the traction data, about 10 billion has been poured into Indian software companies in the last five years. That is less than what Swiggy, Paytm, and Zomato have raised. Just three companies. Right? So, and only about maybe like 40 companies have done a series D in India in software. So the problem is not the thematic bets. The problem is where's the money for follow-on capital available for these companies to mature? You know, product development requires serious money. I mean, I've known startups in Israel who have taken like six years to come out of beta. In Indian product context, you will not get money beyond 18, 24 months. So where is the, uh, where is the, uh, of, you know, the motivation to build excellent products out of India? That I think is missing, and that will come with risk capital. And that risk capital is not available. Yeah. So um, one of the things that's very important, um, uh, very early on, I just want to know each of your perspectives when you're working with early stage um, entrepreneurs, right? It could be your friends also, not necessarily your portfolio company, your fellow entrepreneurs. You know, when they're starting off, what are those uh, two, three things that they really look for? Because I think there's some commonality, uh, but I just want to know in your personal experiences, you know, what are those initial things that founders look for and where do you guys really add value? at a fund level or at an individual level. So we'll start with you, Govind. So the question was what founders look for? How does a VC add value to a founder's journey? And what are those two, three things that an entrepreneur looks for in their early, sure. early days? So when I, so everyone looks at different stages, right? So there's sectoral expertise, there's basic help. So I come in at the first check stage and I cater to first time founders or experienced corporates who are moving to a founding role. So I think the first is demystifying this whole journey in the sense actually helping them understand how much amount of capital has to be raised, what they have to look at, where the investor ethos mass is. So just being a friend who explains it is something important. Second, I think all of them need a significant network. So suppose you're starting something in B2B SaaS. If I have the ability to make the founder speak to Bhavish or someone who runs a $10 million revenue B2B SaaS company, or potential customers who will be looking at it. So opening doors is a second play which is very, very important for founders. And third is at the early stage just being an emotional support because you may have two good meetings, you may have two bad days, someone may say no, someone may say yes, just helping them stay the course. Because in a world of competing deals, you have to build your niche. And we build, I build my niche by spending enough time helping them meet people and they automatically respect the fact that you know, you're in it with them and you, you are in it for the long run. So introductions, being a friend and helping them demystify the whole journey. So Meer, you tell me how was it as your early days as a, you know, entrepreneur? Uh, you know, what were those two, three things that you look for? And I hope your investors gave you what you were looking for. Uh, we want to go into the latter part, but yeah. Uh, the former part, I mean, I think most uh, VCs have an overestimation of how much they help the founder. The founder only helps themselves. And uh, really what I've done is, you know, practiced what, uh, you know, I believed in and what I did was really if the founder needs anything and if they give you a call, you show up. Pretty much that, you know, there's so many times all these VCs will, especially in the angel scene, right, I can introduce you to this one and that one. Today the world is so well networked, I can get to anybody I want to if I really want to as a founder. Uh, and that's part of actually being a good founder is opening up any doors that you want, being, having the ability to uh, do that. So, you know, for me, it's really, I think, uh, thankfully, whichever firms I've invested in, I end up just, like, practicing the ability to show up for them. Whenever they need something, they reach out. 
Some founders offer different capability and ability, depending on that, whatever they need. If they need introductions, they need help, they need somebody to bounce ideas off, or they're just having a dark day. Uh, it's just about that, really. It's about, uh, you know, I think that's the best form of support you can show is the gift of giving them the time. And ideally, if they can plan it well in advance, if not, if they need it urgently, at that point of time. I think that's the best thing you can do besides money. So I think uh, what another thing which the founder wants is, he's not only looking at money, he's also looking at how the angel can work with the founder. And some of the panelists have said how the connections can be made, right? And typically we've seen on the LV platform where with over 13 and a half thousand angels, people specializing in D2C, health tech would love to work with the founders, help them connect. And some of them have sold their own companies. And that ability to connect to one plus one and make it actually 11 uh, makes it very, very key. Number one. Number two, uh, it's not only about money, like I said. That's why we've launched Scalix today, where we're actually going beyond money, but being there and letting the founder focus on his core, and we look after everything else, right, uh, as a platform. These are the two, two things, I think, which we've been try trying to do for founders. Bhavish? Yeah, so, you know, my view on this is slightly controversial. Uh, I don't think, you know, I think all VC funds struggle to add value to their... Uh, uh, portfolios. The reason is very simple. Um, if the VC was so good at operating, he would be running his own business. He would not be investing. So that's one. And I think uh, the second thing is no VC who comes and meets once a quarter should be giving advice to a founder who's in the trenches day in, day out. At least that's my view. And what about you? Our role is limited here because we don't fund directly. But I think if founders are a client, so what we can do with them, sometimes they take too much of a risk. So we tell them to separate, you know, you know, mentally they can't separate between personal family wealth versus the business. So they tend to keep it together. So I tell them that you separate it because business you are good at, but there are a lot of things which uh, your family may not understand or not inclined to do, you are so passionate about it. So have that demarcation that you need to have, uh, you know, the, the, the business risk you separate from uh, the family wealth and try to manage your portfolio in that way. The second thing, we tr because many founders are our clients, so we bring them together. So that helps, you know, so if I know that there is an opportunity where, uh, you know, they can collaborate or one can become a customer of others or they can collaborate, somebody is good in technology, other uh, person is good in strategy, so can we bring them together? So those are the things we help. Yeah, I think, uh, um, you know, with my previous experience with funds and now, I think one of the things is sometimes I think a founder is just looking for a sounding board or a punching bag um, because there are so many things that's happening, going wrong and so on, especially for first-time founders, right? I mean, it's a lot more mature now. At least you have so many buddies around you as opposed to, say, five years ago, right? I mean, you, you can just reach out to anyone. Uh, but I think, yeah, being a sounding board, I think it's really important. And, you know, they always, always say, right, there's a popular saying that during your um, best days, all your investors are your best friends, right? I think that uh, the real test is during your bad days, you know, that, then that's when you get a true sense of, you know, your investors and how supportive they are. So, yeah, I guess there's only a tough way to learn that. So, thank you so much, guys. Um, I'll just take a minute or two and check if anybody has any questions that they want to ask. I'm, so, I'm opening the floor if anybody has any questions for anybody here. Okay. So, I guess most questions are answered. So, thank you so much thank you. for joining us today. Thank, thank you, Shalini. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much.